everyone from wherever you're joining. Thank you so much for being here today for this NCAR Explorer series conversation from numbers to images, visualizing space weather with Dr. Michael Wildberger. My name is Dr. Abby McCumber and I am an educational designer for the NCAR Explorer series. The National Center for Atmospheric Research or NCAR is a world leading organization dedicated to understanding earth system science, including our atmosphere, weather, climate, the sun, and the importance of all of these systems to our society. I am really glad to be with all y'all today. For this conversation, we will take questions at the end, but please definitely submit any questions you might have during the talk using the Slido platform. If you scroll down this webpage, you can see the Slido window just below where you are seeing the live stream video of this event. If you haven't already, go ahead and click on the green join event button and then you can ask questions on the Q&A tab and answer poll questions on the polls tab, both of which are found in that blue bar across the top. And definitely be sure to join Slido to add your thoughts to our word cloud question. What do you think of when you hear space weather? Because we are going to get to that really soon. This conversation is also being recorded and will be available on the NCAR Explorer Series website. With us today, we have NCAR scientist, Dr. Michael Wiltberger. Dr. Michael Wiltberger is the deputy director of the High Altitude Observatory at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Prior to that, he served as the head of geospace section in the Atmospheric and Geospace Science Division at the National Science Foundation. His main area of research is the modeling of the magnetosphere and its interaction with the solar wind and couple thermosphere ionosphere system. Dr. Wiltberger earned his bachelor's degree in physics from Clarkson University and his PhD in space plasma physics from the University of Maryland College Park. Amongst his many scientific accomplishments are pioneering work on the inclusion of ionospheric flow, outflow, and the application of advanced statistical analysis in global models and groundbreaking results proving the connection between localized reconnection and the so-called burst to bulk flows in high resolution simulations of the magneto tail. During his career, Dr. Wiltberger also has served in many important community functions, including as chair of the GEM steering committee, vice chair of the AMS Science and Technology Committee on Space Weather, and as vice chair of the Solar Wind Magnetosphere Interactions Panel of the 2010 NRC Decadal Survey, survey for Solar and Space Physics. Mike, can you turn your camera on and give a quick hello before we check out the work cloud? Hi, Abby. Uh, is everything working all right? Yeah, everything's doing great. How are you doing? I'm good. I don't know if I can live up to that intro, but I'll try. Um, well, we're going to do this, and it's all going to be great. Are you excited to talk about space weather? Yes, of course I am. Okay. Okay. So now before I turn this over to our speaker, let's check out your thoughts on our work cloud. Paul and Brad, would you share a slide for us? Let's see. Oh, what do they think about space weather? The sun? Yes. Ah, Dr. Wilberger, there's someone who thinks about you in this. Um, so how do you think our audience did with that answer for space weather? I think they did really great. There's lots of uh, lots of key things in there. Uh, imminent peril is a little concerning, but uh, maybe not imminent, but certainly certainly some challenges that come from space weather. And I think there might be a few of my family members out there that that's probably why the Dr. Michael Wilberger is showing up in there. Yeah, my nephew. There you go. See, I told you there's some family in the audience. <laughs> I mean, family is always important. Okay. Indeed. So, Mike, I think we're all familiar with weather on Earth. Like. I am familiar with hurricanes, I am familiar with storms, we have drought, but what exactly is space weather? And so space weather is, a, is an encompassing term that we use to talk about uh, the processes that are happening in the near Earth space environment. They all originate uh, on the sun and, and we have analogs to, to hurricanes uh, that are called coronal mass ejections that come through interplanetary space and, and impact the, the, the area around the Earth we call geospace uh, or the magnetosphere as, as was in my introduction there. And we uh, have those impacts on our technologies, uh, you know, satellites that we have, the long line power lines that are around and, and communications. Uh, we talk about technology now and get more dependent on it, but actually there were impacts for space weather dating back to the 1800s and long telegraph lines. 
Okay, okay. So before I ask you another question, I just want to make sure that our audience is looking at Slido and answering those questions because the upcoming Slido question is one that I am very intrigued about, which is how can scientists study space weather? So please make sure that you're answering all of those questions. Um, one thing that you just mentioned was something called the geospace system. Um, can you please define it for our audience and tell me and us why it's so important to study it? Yeah, so as I uh, mentioned earlier, we uh, the, the geospace is the near Earth space environment that we have out there, you know, sort of out to the orbit of the moon, maybe a little bit further beyond that that we're talking about. And uh, in collaboration with colleagues that I have at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, we recently received funding from NASA for a project that we're calling the Center for Geospace Storms. And what we're working on there is to develop numerical models to tell us what is going on in the in the geospace environment uh, as these big solar storms uh, come and impact the Earth. I was told that you had a video that you wanted to show us about space weather. I do. So let me pop up my first animation okay. here. Let's do the, the screen sharing. Okay. Go. First movie coming up. So this is a, an animation uh, that was produced by uh, the teams at the NASA Goddard uh, Space Flight Center. And it shows right here at the beginning, uh, we got the surface of the sun, uh, the undulating surface of the sun with a little dark uh, sunspots that are uh, emerging there. And then right about now, we're going to see a solar flare uh, occurring and then the release of the coronal mass ejection, a big, massive ball of hot ionized gas that we call plasma that has a magnetic field embedded in it. And then that is going to come and interact with the geospace environment, this area that you see here with the Earth's magnetic field being squished on the day side, and energy and plasma being deposited down into the night side of the system, what we call the magneto tail. Magnetic reconnection occurs within that process. Particles get ejected down the field lines and light up the aurora borealis, one of the other fascinating aspects of space weather, perhaps one of the most beautiful aspects of space weather. I'm going to stop my screen share and pop my face back on the screen. Yeah. So was that an animation? Was that a visualization? What was it? Yeah, so that was a, a, the work of a talented team of, of artists working in collaboration with the scientists to, to, to produce an animation, a, a cartoon, if you will, uh, telling us a little bit of what's going out there to, to get the, the basic concepts of what's going on, an eruption and a flare on the sun, the CME propagating through space, interaction with the Earth's magnetic field. But it's just an animation. It's just a cartoon uh, depiction of it. It tells us the, the aspects of what's going on, but it isn't a, a, a real rendering of, of uh, output from a numerical model, for example. Okay. okay. Um, so before we move on, I just want to see what our audience thinks about how can scientists study space weather? Because you are going to talk to us about that in a second. So if you could tell me, ooh. Let's see, through satellites, remote sensing. There's a lot of remote sensing. Hmm. How do we feel yeah. about that? Yeah, those are some really good good uh, answers in, in coming in the, into play there. Satellites certainly play uh, a, a key role, and, and remote sensing is cameras and, and other things looking at the, 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 the sun, the, the, the processes that are coming on there. We also actually have in situ, or being actually able like to be like a buoy in the in the stream, measuring the, the waves that are coming in. We, we have a satellite just upstream of the Earth that tells us what the direction of the magnetic field is going to be in the solar wind, and how hot and how fast that ball of gas that's exploding in the in the CME is coming at the Earth uh, and, and lets us know a little bit of advanced warning about what we're going to experience in, in any upcoming geomagnetic storm or geospace storm. Okay. And there were other good things on there, magnetometers in the ground, cameras, satellites. The one thing I didn't see on there uh, is the way I uh, used to, to study space weather, and that's through numerical simulations, um, models, data. There it is. It, I just needed to scroll further down. 
<laughs> funding is the main requirement. There you go. Uh, yeah, but we do, I do like to get paid. So yes, funding is an important uh, aspect of uh, uh, being able to study space weather. But yeah, as I was saying, the, the key way that I uh, do and, and my, the folks that work with me study space weather is through the development of, of numerical uh, space weather models. And just like the analogy that we were talking about in the beginning of, of numerical weather prediction, and there, you know, that tells you whether it's going to rain tomorrow, whether it's going to be a big snowstorm, we're working on the development of numerical weather models to tell us what's going to happen in, in the space environment and, uh, and provide information for the impacts that we can see coming in out of that. And in fact, oh, go ahead. Yes, you're going to tell me something. No, I was going to ask you if there were any projects that were trying to address how we study storms in space if we cannot see them. So it's like you were reading my mind. Right. I'm just gonna say I'm reading your mind. I have I have you're right. One of the one of the real challenges for what we're doing is is being able to 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 visualize that. There's some remote sensing. You can see the aurora from space and you can even see the aurora uh sometimes from the space station. There's some really cool videos out there for for that online. But getting that global view, global picture of the of the geospace system of the magnetosphere is is a real challenge. And that's where the output of the numerical models, the numerical weather prediction models that we're that I do work on and developing come in handy. And so uh why why don't I go to my next video that shows a little bit of what the uh, um, the, the magnetosphere looks like. And so I will share that in just a second here. There we go. That's coming through okay, right? Perfect. So this is a this is going to be an animation uh, dr driven by the actual data, the numerical data from from our computer codes that are solving the you know the physical equations that describe the system. Uh, and and what you what you're seeing in this in this animation is that that artist lines being turned into real uh, renderings going on there. The Earth uh, it, magnetic field on the day side is getting squished by the solar wind flow. The, the flow is interacting with a long edge there, creating lots of little turbulence ed eddies along the, ed the the side that comes into play. I'll play it again here to, just to make it come into play. We're seeing some magnetic reconnection on the on the day side, some eddies evolving, and then you're going to see some magnetic reconnection happening down in that distant tail region and the flows that are coming into play there. The the plane that, that you're seeing that's in sort of green and purple is, is the Earth's magnetic field with the Earth's dipole subtracted off. So you can see where it's squished in uh, on, on the day side and stretched out on the night side. And then the, the, the other cut plane that, that's coming up on it through the center of the Earth is telling us about the strength of the currents that are flowing in there, where there's bends and kinks in the field lines. We see a lot more current coming into play. All right, I guess I should stop sharing that one so we can get back to No, questions. this is great. Um, but once again, it's like you're reading my mind. I was just told that there we have some questions from the audience. So let's see. Haha. The do aurora formation affect temperature of the lower atmosphere? They were paying attention. You mentioned the aurora, so it's all clicking. It is indeed all clicking, and and the uh, the energetic particles that are fl flowing down along the field lines uh, do interact with the, the particles in the upper upper levels of the atmosphere, and they do heat that region of the atmosphere up and can affect uh, the the orbits of satellites. But that's happening at hundreds of kilometers up out into space, and the gas is pretty pretty rarefied up there. So there are not any significant impacts and on lower atmospheric temperature from from the aurora. Great. Um, so let's see. Huh. Let's see. What are the current? Oh, this one is actually, yeah, that's, I was trying to figure out which one I wanted to ask more. They're both so good. Um, if the sun has coronal mass ejections, does that mean that someday it will run out of energy? Well, the, the so sun like, will someday run out of energy, and and but that someday is way, 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 billions and billions and billions of years in in the future. Um, and the coronal mass ejections are part of the losses of of, of material and, and and matter on the on the sun. But actually, there's always uh, uh, stuff coming off of the surface of the sun. It's called the solar wind, uh, and it's blowing out into into space and sort of filling it up with with the rarefied gases, and that's contributing to the to the evolution of the sun. But but fundamentally, it's the processes that are happening down interior of the sun, the nuclear fusion that's going on there that'll eventually slow down and stop. Okay. Let's see, and the last question we have for right now. 
Uh -oh. Maybe. We'll see. Maybe. Oh, wow. oh, no, there's okay. a lot of questions. Oh, this is the question from Mohammed. Um, yeah, so this is a great question, and it was what I was going to ask you. So, Mohammed, thank you. Um, could you please explain how these animations are made? Um, and they're asking something that is a little bit more complicated than I would have asked, which is which software is used to make it? Yes, yeah, so so uh, thanks for that uh, um, in insightful question there. Uh, to to answer the second question first, because it's actually quote unquote easier, uh, we we use a program called Paraview, um, uh, which is a, 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 a visualization tool that was developed by uh, I think the Department of Energy. But but what it is doing is we run this numerical simulation, and so throughout the entire volume of space, you know, thirty times the radius of the Earth uh, up into the solar wind, and three hundred times the radius of the Earth down into the tail, and about a hundred times in Y and Z. In that entire space, we have a whole hundreds and hundreds of, of grid points in the simulation. And at each point, we know what the how, how much material is there, how hot the material is there, how how what direction it is flowing, and where the what the magnetic field is in that. We bring that all that data into the, the Paraview visualization program and are able to slice it. Uh, and dice it and do different things with it. So we slice it and are able to color it with the, the colors of the magnetic field. We can look at what the, where the currents are strawing there. And then we're able to, to trace magnetic field lines, which are those green and blue things that, that, that I'm pointing to on my screen, because I still have the movie up, but nobody else can see that. So that's not too helpful. But, but that, that, that they may be able to remember the, the movie that, that I showed earlier and, and then what was going on from, from in that perspective. So hopefully that that gives Mohammed a, a high level answer to to what he was going after with his question. Um, one of the things that we have talked about that the audience doesn't know that we have talked about is that there is a collaboration between NCAR, the High Altitude Observatory, um, and a few places to develop new numerical models to understand and predict space weather. Could you please talk to us a little bit about that Center for Geospace Storm project. Yeah, right. So uh, the the Center for Geospace Storms, uh, as my as my background uh, uh, shows here, is is a, a NASA funded uh, center to study the and develop numerical models for the the near Earth space environment, the geospace region. It's a collaboration uh, between uh, NCAR HAO and led by uh, my my friend and colleague Slava Merkin at uh, the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, and then we have collaborators. At, at a bunch of different universities, uh, UCLA, Rice, uh, some private companies, Syntac, uh, and I'm sure I'm leaving somebody off, so I'm making the Academy Award faux pas of not having the list in front of me. And I apologize to anybody who, who institution I've forgotten on the list there, but it's a great group of, of, of scientists uh, that are working uh, to develop these new models and, and really use the models to probe the fundamental science of what's going on in the, in the, in the geospace system. So you showed us a video that had an amazing visualization that you made. And in a few seconds, we are going to talk a little bit about how you can build them. Um, in the meantime, I also want to remind our audience that we're going to discuss how much data goes into a visualization. So please make sure that you have answered that slider question. Um, so let's move on and talk a little bit about um, how do we build visualizations using data. Um, so when we talk about data, it may be very difficult to imagine the amount of information that you need to put in there. So before you tell me the correct answer, I want to see how much data our audience thinks that is going to be involved in creating that typical visualization. So if I can please see the slide of Paul. Whoa. Three terabytes, 50 gigs, 100 megabytes. Okay. So our audience is spot on, um, but could you help us please put those numbers into context? Like how big are we talking about? 
Um, right. So, you know, uh, it, it, of course, the size of the visual, the, the data that we're uh, talking about depends on the resolution that we're using to do our simulation. But we can do we can do really good stuff with 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 three terabytes of, of, of output. And, and that's, you know, uh, a sizable fraction of your hard drive or a fraction of the hard drive for for what you're getting there. It's more than more more data than you can put onto your phone. Right. You know, you get couple hundred gigabytes on your phone, um, uh, but it can fill up, you can get it onto a computer there. We, we do really, really high resolution simulations. We can push that up into the, you know, hundreds of terabytes and, and maybe even into the petabyte range um, uh, down the line with the new big computer that's coming into NCAR that we're super excited to play with. So you told me that 500 kilobytes, if I am not mistaken, so please correct me if I make this up, <laughs> Um, it is about how much data was required to send a mission to the moon. Um, and right now we're working with like three terabytes. How have we gone from like needing so little information to needing so much to make a great visualization? Yeah, so so uh, the, the, actually the numbers for the the memory of the the uh, Apollo guidance computer were actually measured in words, and and so it was even less than five hundred kilobytes of of data for what the what the memory was for the guidance computer on the uh, Apollo spacecraft, and so you know you've got you know a couple hundred gigabytes, you know thousands and thousands of times more memory uh, available to you on your film. The, the question you might want to ask yourself is, are you doing anything as important as going to the moon with your phone? But, you know, I'll leave that to leave that to leave that as an uh, unanswerable question for the audience to, to to think about that comes into play. Uh, the 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 question you did ask me about how do we get so much data coming out and how do how do we do that? It, it, it's what we're able to do with the the incredible advances that have happened with computing power um, uh, since we've gone to the moon and and beyond. Right. You know, the first com computers, the first supercomputers were were running and doing weather prediction models here at NCAR. And, and they have grown by leaps and bounds and orders of magnitude since then uh, because of the increasing computing power in, in, in there known as Moore's law sort of the doubling that, that comes into play. And, and of course, you give a scientist the ability to, to get more resolution, to, to probe it further, and we're going to run it right up to the max and, and see what we can get out of it. And, and that's where we're going with it. And we get lots of data coming out from it from that perspective. This may be similar to something you answered before, um, but what are some things that you are thinking about or what techniques are you using to create a visualization? Yeah, so I touched a little bit on that to the answer to to Mohammed's question. Um, and but you know what I'm going to do here actually is is I'm going to uh, pop up my next movie because I'm going to be able to use that to talk a little bit about um, what we're what we're seeing, what we're going after, and, and sort of the considerations that 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 come into play here. So I'm going to deviate just a little bit and get us going from that. So. So this is uh, a, another um, uh, animation that I, or scientific visualization that I developed to, to, to do some studies of the, the flows that are happening in the, the, the portion of the earth on the, on the night side that we call the, call the magneto tail. And the considerations that we're wanting to look at here, we wanted to be able to understand uh, the changes and and the and the perturbations that were happening in the magnetic field uh, around the Earth, uh, and we wanted to know where it was deviating from the sort of the normal dipole that that happens that comes out of the Earth that makes your compass work, right? It makes the compass point to the points to the North Pole, and and on the on the day side, the solar wind is blowing in and it's squishing the squishing the field together and it's compressing it, and so. We wanted to be able to show that compression. We needed a color table or a color process that tells you something about compression. So you use that green portion of the color table to show you where the field is compressed, but it's also going to get stretched out on the on the on the night side and, and other reasons. So we needed a, another color to tell us where it's stretched out. So we wanted to be able to use that color that goes from purple to white and then over to green to be able to show us the stretching and compression that happens in the in the in the magnetosphere as it as it's going forward with it. 
But there's more going on in the in the system than just the changes in the magnetic field. The the plasma is is flowing, it's moving, and, and I want to be able to see and understand where those where those flows are happening, where the where the imp impacts and information is propagating through the system. So what you see in that little background right there are right now just a bunch of little dots that are maybe a little bit hard to see, but if you look down here in the in the corner there, you see those dots are actually little arrows, and the little arrows are set up to tell us which direction the flow is happening, and in that region they're flowing back down the tail there. And the length of the arrow is also telling us how strong the, the, the flow is happening there. But that could be a little hard to see, especially when sometimes when the arrows are pointing around. So to make that a little bit more visually appealing and to help people understand what's going on with the intensity of the flow, I color each of those arrows with a with a with um, another color table that goes from this sort of yellow, red, uh, in orange into red, kind of a burning color table. The, the more orange it is, the, the, the brighter it's burning, the stronger that flow is that, that that's happening in the in the system itself. And so... Uh, this is for a, a study that I uh, did. This is actually a, a movie that, that it's in a scientific journal article. Scientific journals have gotten to the point where you can actually attach the the, the movies that we produce and have it be part of the paper that, that comes into play here. So I'm going to let this play. And, and it's a little bit slower than what you're seeing there. But the interplanetary magnetic fields turn southward. Uh, the energy is being deposited in the system. We're seeing little vortices happening along the edges. And as it evolves, looking way down in the tail, we're going to see flows coming in that are bursting in and getting fairly, fairly narrow and propagating inward and, and, and evolving and changing in direction and moving around in, in the system itself. And then there, there's bursts of energy that come in and vary as the as the input goes for it there. And so the the visualization is trying to tell us comprehensively what's going on in the in the system and the and the variations that are occurring in a way that, that I think is visually appealing, but also visually informative, right? We know where the intensities of the fields are changing, where fields getting compressed, where fields getting stretched, uh, and how those those field stretches and compressions relate to the flows that are happening that are occurring in, in the system. So bringing all these techniques together helps us to understand and, and create the, the scientific visualization that goes beyond just the, the cartoon animation that we were talking about uh, at the beginning or the overview visualization that was in my, my second movie. Wow, so that's... I will stop sharing that and <laughs> let the conversation yeah. flow. Yeah, no, that's really like a very interesting visualization. Um, and like go, hearing you go through the process of how you assign certain colors, it's very, very interesting. Um, how does having those visualizations help people like you do science? How can yeah, you so, have that and say, whoa? Right, yes. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, thanks for that uh, interesting thing. And, and, um, uh, like all artists do, um, the, what you're seeing is is the result of lots and lots of iteration, right? I tried something, it didn't work. I tried a different color table. Um, uh, it wasn't helping me see what I needed to see. And so you get eventually to a point where uh, you are... Um, able to, to get this kind of kind of global perspective that comes into play. And one of the things that looking at that initial movie was able to do for me was to able to see that the flows weren't happening in a, in a straight line. They were evolving. They were, they were changing their direction. They were coming back and forth in the interactions that were happening there. And when we observe the system currently with satellites, we only have one or two little satellite missions out there at a time, or, or maybe uh, maybe a handful uh, for some of the more recent uh, things that come into play. And so being able to understand how a single data, data point fits into the interconnection of what was happening further back that may have actually not been directly behind it, may have been coming from somewhere somewhere off the line, uh, uh, helps helps evolve that understanding. And so then I was able to use the, the visualization to isolate into individual points extract more data and understand the connections and the interplay that were that were happening in there and be able to to prove that the that the features the, the the fronts that we were seeing in that in that simulation correspond to what uh satellites are seeing if they look at large numbers of these things over time so you are able to bring space to your hands and just manipulate it to understand what is happening yep. is that what you're saying Yep, bring space to my hands and manipulate it, and I can move it up and down, and and uh, I slice and dice it from different directions, and be able to see what 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 gems are hidden inside the simulation oh. results. Right. 
Um, one last question, which is like, what data did you need to create that visualization? So uh, the simulation uses uh, observations from the, the the buoy that I talked about earlier in the in the and the in between the Earth and the Sun to tell us how hard the solar wind is flowing, uh, what direction the magnetic field is, and how much of it is there. We feed that is in as a, as an input to the to the simulation, and then we crank up thousands of cores of computing power and let it run for hours and hours and hours and it spits out the the terabytes of of data that tell us about the 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 density of the material the the flow uh, strength and direction uh, how hot it is and um uh, what the magnetic field is direction in the in the points throughout there and then i'm able to create the slice and dice uh these cut planes and whatnot using the the pair view tool okay um before I take questions from the audience, I also want to remind that we have one more slide of question that we're going to go through. So please make sure you at, answer that. That one is legitimately my favorite one out of all of the ones we are asking. Um, but let's bring up two audience questions that we have. Let's see. So this one, you mentioned current. How much current is flowing from these charged particles over what volume of space? Yeah, so that's a great question, um, uh, and it, it it depends on which region of space that we're that we're talking about. But the the currents that are flowing down along the 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 field lines that are uh, creating the the aurora borealis and closing through the through that region there, they're measured in mega amps. So there's there's a lot of current flowing there. There's a lot of energy that that that's pot, that's coming into that system. Uh, there are different regions in space that have different different intensities, but that's one area that, that gets kind of there. And I was told there was one more. Cool. Yeah. Ooh. What does an ideal visualization tool look like for you? What features and capabilities would you like the software to have to analyze data, space weather data? Oof. So this that's one? a darn good question. An ideal visualization is is a uh it, 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 one I haven't really thought about trying to figure out the answer to, but it, 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 I think the ideal visualization is the one that can clearly and most concisely show the information about what I'm trying to get after, right? So if I'm trying to understand the flow structure, it needs to be able to uh, illuminate that. If I want to understand how the magnetic field lines are are changing or evolving, I need to be able to see those 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 field lines and 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 what comes into play there. Um, the 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 key features that the the second part of that question there about what are the key features that make that happen and make that possible right you want to be able to 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 have uh the the software be able to read in the terabytes of data uh and fairly quickly uh and create uh, uh what we call a rendering a view of the of the of the data that we have there and then you want to be able to manipulate the direction you're looking at right i want to look at it from the left i want to look at it from the right i want to look at it from down below uh, uh, so I can see what what changes are occurring there. So it's got to have the ability to change that camera view and 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 perspective. And then I need to be able to slice and cut it through any which way and any any which direction that that comes into play and plot the parameters that 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 are needed to understand that how hot it is, how much is there, uh, where's it going, uh, those kinds of fundamental things that come into play. And and there's a lot of great tools out there for doing that. Um, uh, and and Paraview is just one of them. It's one that I know, uh, and so I use it a fair amount. Yeah. That was such a great question. Um, we have been talking a lot about visualizations, um, but we have not started talking about how being able to have those visualizations help us on Earth. So what effects can solar storms have on Earth and our society? Yeah, so uh, there are a variety of effects that that come into play uh, for space weather on on Earth and in the near Earth environment. Uh, I mentioned a few of them earlier on. The the one that, that related to the question that came from one of the earlier folks there, the aurora, or the energy that comes in. It heats up the uh, heats up the ionosphere and thermosphere. You're heating it up. You're making the gas expand. 
that gas is expanding into the orbits where the satellites are, and you can create satellite drag and change the orbital characteristics that come into play that happens there. That energy comes in, it creates ionization that affects the ability of radio waves to communicate through there. So you can have impacts on, on, on communication and, and satellite navigation for, for GPSs. And then uh, coming back to the, the last question that was asked about the currents that are flowing, those currents that are flowing, the, the mega amps of currents and the field aligned currents that are flowing from, from the magnetosphere down into the near Earth, uh, into the ionosphere, thermosphere, uh, closed through there. And, and you may remember back from your high school physics class or maybe your college physics class. I know it's getting scary here, right? But when there's a current flowing, there's also a magnetic field that it's created by that by the current flows. And those magnetic field changes and whatnot can have impacts on um, power grids and the long lines of the power grids that, that are that are part of what we have here. And in fact, if you want, I can show you a little visualization we've done to um, uh, get into that. So the, the next animation that I have here is coming up in just a second. I just got to get to the share. So then, so this uh, animation that we're seeing, or visualization that we're seeing here, is showing the Earth in three different views. So the so the top view is is showing us uh, will be showing us what the the changes are for the magnetic field uh, that is coming from the currents that are flowing that we were talking about earlier. There, those magnetic fields can interact uh, with the uh, the solid rocks of the Earth, the conductivity of the Earth, and create electric fields. Uh, and then those electric fields in turn can impact the power grid. And the the, the last line, the, the last plot that you see there shows, you know, the long lines of the power grid that is used to transmit power um, uh, throughout throughout the United States. And so this is a, a simulation that we did with our code. Um, looking at the impact of what would have happened if there had been a really big coronal mass ejection from the sun propagating through interplanetary space and, and impacting the, the, the Earth. It, this actually was a, the data from this is actually from a real event that happened, but it was observed by a, a spacecraft that was um, a, a off to the side of the Earth. So the, this event didn't hit the Earth, but it gives us some kind of ground truth of what a really big event would be like to feed into the, into the simulation. So with that, let me start things playing here and so time's evolving in the in the top there you're going to see um uh, uh shortly some uh evolution of the the changes in the in the magnetic field coming into play and then the little light up of um uh the green electric field, green to yellow electric fields in the in the Midwest of the United States, and then along the along the East Coast, and where those um, uh, electric fields are strongest, there you can see it, it it driving geomagnetically induced currents, GICs, in the in the long line power grid lines that 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 come into play uh, that that happens there, and it and that's a significant impact, and it's a it's a it's a really interesting. Uh, combination of physics that's coming into play, right? So it's the physics that I do for um, uh, the, the space weather and understanding that top panel, the, the magnetic field that comes into play. But then I got to talk to the geologists and get data from the U.S. Geological Survey to understand what the conductivity of the Earth is like. What do the rocks do and how, how, how well do they allow the electric field to propagate? And it turns out Wisconsin's got some really old and conductive rocks in it right there. So that's why Wisconsin lights up a bit. And then there's also a bit more, um, uh, you know, connectivity in the in the East Coast in that New York Washington D.C. corridor that comes into play. And then we got to talk to the power grid folks and get information about what the power grid is and where those field line, where those power lines are aligned and, and being able to understand uh, the, the, the length and structure that comes into play to be able to calculate a proxy for that, that, that magnetic field or excuse me, that, that current that's flowing in, the, in those power lines that can lead to challenges for, for the power grid. Uh, there have been in the past disruptions to the, to the power grid. A uh, famous event everybody talks about is in, in March of 1989 where there were, where there were disruptions uh, in the Hydro Quebec uh, power grid that led to led to outages and cascade failures through there. There was a big storm in 2003 that didn't have any impacts uh, in the U.S. power grid, but did create some in interesting disruptions in in um, uh, uh, the Baltic region and, and also some some disruptions in in South Africa. Should I play hey. it one more time, or should we? Uh... Hold, hold on to that thought because I'm going to ask. Um, that we shared the Slido answers about the energy released from the solar flare, because I think we can call back to that map and just 
see what it says. So the energy released from the solar flare, which is what I think that visualization was getting at that caused the largest recorded solar storm on Earth was equivalent to, and the correct answer is 10 billion atomic bombs, which is the scariest number to me. But what I get from your video is that we will be fine um, based on that visualization that we could possibly handle it because we have models that help us understand that. Is that correct based on that video? Yeah, we will be we will be fine. We might have some challenges. We might have some disruptions that we that we need to to, to deal with. Um, the the ten billion atomic bombs is the energy being released in that solar flare. Not all of that energy is going to be coming directly to to Earth, and not all of it is going to be uh, impacting us here. But but it's going to cause uh, could cause some significant challenges uh, to to what we uh, do here, and and that's part of why uh, space weather is is one of the items that's in. The, the the Homeland Security National Risk Register, or working in the government and agencies and folks like us in NCAR are working to, to understand that, to create better predictions, to be able to, to help uh, us be prepared in the event of a major space weather event. Brings me to trying to communicate with people and explaining all of the science to people, because as a scientist, we know that one of the biggest challenges is being able to take all of the information that we are given, interpret it, and then effectively communicate with all audiences. Um, and I know that you have used some tools. So could you tell us what tools have you used in order to communicate all of this information that you get from visualizations to the general public? Yeah. So. Uh, that, that is one of the real challenges in science, right? We have this tendency to, to be able to, to fall back on our equations and our, and our complicated terminology, which we need to be able to talk to each other and understand the, the precise and subtle differences that, that come into play. But we also really want to be able to, to have everybody uh, have a, a grasp and an understanding of, of what we're doing and, and the, the beauty and majesty of, of what we're coming after in, in that. And, and my colleagues at the, the Center for Geospace Storms uh, developed uh, a collaboration uh, with some artists uh, that were working on a show um, called uh, Worlds Beyond Earth that premiered at the Hayden Planetarium, but as I understand it now is, is uh, being released in more broadly and it's available at, at, at maybe at a planetarium near you. I went to the Air and Space Museum last weekend with my, with my cousin and it was, it was showing and available there. So you may be able to see that. Uh, and, and what I want to show you in this last thing is is kind of coming back full circle uh, of the what we were doing at the beginning, right? I showed you an animation, an artist's rendering of of what was kind of going on in the in the nearer space environment, and and the artists worked together with my colleagues at the at the center to produce this next video that that shows um, uh, the, what you can do when you join art and science together. So let me. Uh, bring up the last video here. And this is uh, from that show. What you're looking at here is, is a view coming in, zooming in on Earth. The, the little the white lines that you see there are various orbits of objects. The, 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 the big object that you see, the white line that you see there is the, is the orbit of the moon. And then here comes the data from the, the simulation that we had uh, provided to them. And you can see the, the variations that are coming into play. They did a, a, a coloring of, of the field lines and has the intensity that, that comes into play. You can see this, this big storm evolving and coming through there. The field lines are opening up uh, and as we as we zoom in. And then as we zoom in closer, we, we get to view the, the, the technosphere is what they called it, right? The, the, the satellites in, in, in around the earth. The big ring that you see there is, is, is geostationary orbit, the orbit where the period matches the orbit of the earth. But then you get closer to the Earth and you got all these satellites that are in, in low Earth orbit, the, the Starlink satellites, the other satellites that are providing observations and whatnot. And you can just kind of get a feel for how many uh, spacecraft are out there and how, how exposed the, the technosphere, the technology that we live in is to the space environment and, and thus the need to be able to provide you know, really good and compelling space weather forecasts. Okay. Um, turns out that asking about atomic bombs makes people think about danger, 
Um, so we have a few questions about dangers that I think it's best to do now since we're so close to the atomic bombs. So sure. if we could please bring those up. Huh? there we go. What are possible dangers to society from space weather? Yeah, so uh, uh, thanks, Robert, for that question. And and the and the dangers range from the the small and annoying to you know the disruptions to communications. Uh, there can actually also be disruptions to the to the GPS uh, signal that can lead to to errors in, in navigation. There's a lot we could do to engineer around uh, that, but but it's certainly something that comes into play. The the the, the variations that that we talked about in the magnetic field and the in the nearer space environment can charge up what we what are known as the the radiation belts the 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 energetic particles that are trapped in that magnetic field and changes in those uh radiation belts can impact the the satellites and then we get closer down into the earth and the and the challenges to the to the power grid come into play and 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 their impacts uh from space weather that, that happen on that side of things okay let's see if there's another question Maybe. Nope. Oh, there. Were, they, 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 oh, oh, there you go. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> huh. That last so, thing sounds familiar, um, but can you tell us anything about the Carrington event of 1869? Yeah, so 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 thanks. Um, uh, that would be my aunt. So thanks, my aunt Peggy, for for that for that question. And uh, yeah, the Carrington event of 1869 is actually one of these the, the, one of the biggest known uh, events uh, of a of a, a coronal mass ejection and a, and a and a storm that happened on the sun uh, that that propagated. And, and Carrington was was a, a solar astronomer that was uh, had a, a telescope observing on it. And he actually saw the 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 bright white flare that that happened with the flare release. And then that CME propagated uh, through interplanetary space and impacted the Earth. And there's actually observations of the changes in the magnetic field that were seen uh, at a magnetometer that was operating in, in Bombay, India. And, and that's one of the biggest events that we know about. And we kind of use that as a, as a touchstone in, in planning and thinking about what could be the impacts of, of a similar event on, on our modern society. Um, ooh. Robert has all the questions and they're all great. Uh, what kinds of satellites upstream from Earth give us warnings of incoming CMEs? So there's two classes, uh, broadly speaking, I'm going to say there's two classes of satellites, there's two classes of observations that we use to give us of warnings of, of, of CMEs. Um, we use one class of satellites that has what's called a coronagraph. And you can think about that as an instrument that makes a, a permanent eclipse. So we, we stick a little thing in there that blocks out the most of the light of the sun so we can see the the, the outside portions of the, the sun where the solar wind is flowing, the, the corona, that, that's the name corona graph that, that comes into play. And when a solar flare and CME happens, we can actually see the perturbation, the density that, that's happening in it from that. So that gives us a little bit of information that a big event has happened on the sun and uh, that it could be propagating towards us. We can use the observations of, of how fast it's moving in the camera images to, to give us a rough idea of when it's going to uh, arrive uh, at the Earth. And then when it gets closer to the Earth, we have a, a category of, of, of in situ is the word I use, the big fat fancy Latin word that just means actually being in there and, and, and measuring it. Uh, and, and there's a probe. Uh, the, there are a variety of spacecraft that do it. Uh, the Advanced Composition Explorer ACE, and then uh, one that's operated by NOAA, that's a, the Discover satellite. And basically, you can think about it as having a, a compass, a magnetic field detector on it that tells us which direction the, um, uh, the magnetic field is inside this big coronal mass ejection. And then uh, a couple of other instruments that tell us how much material there is and how fast it's flowing. And that combination of stuff tells us a little bit, you know, it's our buoy, it's our warning buoy in space that tells us what's coming in uh, for these things. Typically, a CME can take about one to three days, depending on how big it is, to propagate the the, the, the millions of miles from the sun to the Earth. The, that 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 uh, buoy, the ASIT satellite we talk about, is is only about forty five minutes uh, ahead of time, so we only get a very little bit of warning from from that buoy in space. Okay, to continue on with the, the theme of coronal mass ejections, um, 
if the sun has coronal we already did this one. Oh, the, oh yeah, we did do that one. We will not run out of energy now, but future as well. Okay. So speaking of communication, could you recommend resources for the general public that would allow one to better understand the NOAA space weather forecasts? So a great question that comes into play that, that actually on the, the NOAA uh, website, if you if you Google the Space Weather Prediction Center or SWPSI, uh, they have a great web page that, that talks about the uh, the forecasts that they that they put out uh, and that has information about what they have a variety of scales uh, that, that go from one to five and what the magnitudes and impacts of of things are going to be, uh, as you might guess, one is pretty low and, and five is pretty hard or pretty bad or can be potentially pretty bad. Um, we have lots of questions coming in. So let's just keep going. Yes, I only okay. have one more question for you at the end. So yeah, um, I'm a physics student and a musician planning to study the ionosphere and the sounds it makes to pair art and science. Um, any recent studies or thoughts? Yeah, Tiffany, that's a great question. And uh, there's a there's a new emerging uh, area of trying to understand our data um, that's called soundification. And basically, it's taking the data and turning it into into sound waves, into 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 tones that we can that we can understand and and hear. And in the plasma physics field, there's a lot of this because it, a lot of ways that we observe it, or one of the early ways that we observed it was through radio waves. And we could hear these, what were kind of called whistler tones. And they would go little, little whistler waves that, that, that kind of came in there. It sounded like somebody was whistling. And, and so being able to turn that information and turning it into, into, into sound and understanding of it from, from that perspective is, is one of the new ways that people are, are thinking about understanding the data. I, I haven't done a lot with it, but I've seen some really exciting stuff that comes into play there. And it's an interesting way to be able to look at time series information, right? You, your ear can hear lots of things and, and be able to, to detect the patterns. And so, so that combination that you're talking about about the music and the and the and the and the physics coming into play is is a is a fascinating new area for understanding the the data that we that we're producing and, and observing for for our systems. Okay. Ooh, how long does it take <laughs> to crunch the numbers for a visualization? It depends on the 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 big how big of a computer you give me and how big the simulation is, but but it can take um, uh, for some of these you know final renderings it can take you know uh, you know anywhere from a few hours to to overnight. Sometimes I I submit a job to the for the highest resolution rendering I submit a job to the supercomputer and go eat my dinner and come back the next day and and look at the results. Ooh. Are you building a numerical space weather prediction model and how many hours we can forecast priori? priori. So I'm going to assume they want to know how much advanced lead time that we can get from some of our forecasts. So yes, we're working on building a numerical model. Our primary focus is on understanding the science and the and the interactions that are going on in this in this complicated system. But but um, others of my uh, colleagues and throughout the throughout the field have developed numerical models that are currently being used in the Space Weather Prediction Center for for doing forecasts uh, of what kind of impacts that are going to come into play. To drive those models, a large portion of them are limited by that upwind buoy in the in the in the solar wind that I talked about earlier. And so we can get about 45 minutes lead time from that. We can make some guesses uh, for what might be happening based on the, the coronal mass ejection images, the, the pictures that we were using to get a little bit further out, but the fidelity of those forecasts isn't as high as what we would get from that measurement in space because we really don't know what direction the magnetic field is inside that. Understanding that's really one of the key fundamental challenges of the science and our and our uncertainties about how fast and how strong it's flowing are also pretty, pretty broad from those from those simulations. Okay. Ooh, with SPD41, will you be releasing all of your simulation code as open source? And if so, where? 
Yeah, so so for those of you that aren't in the know, um, uh, Space Policy Directive 41 is what SPD 41 talks about, and that is um, uh, a mandate from the, the highest levels of, of, of uh, the government in, into NASA so that the, the scientific codes that we produce to do that are, in fact, um, uh, uh, being able to be released in sort of the open source modality. And so, yes, uh, coming up later this year, it is our intention to put the um, uh, the, the models that we've used out on uh, open source and we'll be releasing them through through Bitbucket. Uh, perhaps more importantly than just putting the code out there, we hope to be providing um, uh, some documentation for what we use and how the code works and and tools that, that go along with it to being able to, to analyze the, the results uh, that come out of it. See, um, when we see a CME coming to Earth, what is the protocol to protect our technosphere and infrastructure? So, uh, Robert, thanks again for the, the great question uh, that comes into play. And, and the, the procedures really uh, drive through uh, that advanced notice of the uh, uh, CME. And then what happens is the Space Weather Prediction Center uh, begins to uh, develop their forecasts and understand that they, they can issue, issue alerts and warning depending on the, the severity of the storm. And then if you know it's the really big one, then they're going to uh, uh, talk to their connections and trigger um, uh, interactions with uh, with FEMA and, and begin the the preparation steps that are needed to respond to to events like that. And, and I guess the other point that I should make uh, on this is that, that that space weather is really kind of a global phenomenon, right? So you know I talked earlier on of not having impacts in the in in the U.S. but having impacts in other parts of the world. It depends on you know where we are in the Earth and when the storm arrives. And so it really is is also um, part of international collaboration and cooperation that that comes into to play for for being able to observe things and also being able to predict and understand where the impacts are going to be. Um, we have one more coronal mass ejection question. Um, ooh, could Tiffany ask, could an intense solar storm like the CME last week ever impact terrestrial weather on Earth? Or like, for example, change the chemical makeup of the atmosphere? So this is a, a question that we're still probing the understanding of. We we don't see a lot of major impacts from the CMEs on the on the weather to the Earth, but there is an interesting interplay of what's happening from the, the weather on the Earth, the big hurricanes, the big flows and uh, perturbations to the to the fields that are happening from the from the mountains on the Earth, and how that interplays with the driving that's coming from above and understanding that interplay and interaction is one of the really key fundamental fundamental questions that we're going after in, in ionosphere, thermosphere physics today. Um, let's see. Oh, and gosh. I think this may be, <laughs> yeah, we only have like three minutes left. So we have a few questions. Um, then I have a question for you. So how many active satellites are oh, out in the Oh, so that's a darn good question. And it's a number that's growing by leaps and bounds with, with companies like, like SpaceX and Spire and, and Planet IQ that are launching small CubeSats. And so I, I think it's in the thousands, maybe even into the into tens of thousands, but I don't know that number off the top of my head. Yeah. And do we get rele relevant magnetic currents in Earth from pulsars? Wow. Okay. So pulsars are stars that are very far <laughs> out that are that are orbiting pretty fast and are producing um, uh, uh, magnetic uh, perturbations that come into play. And I am not aware of anything along the that detections of those that, that comes into play, but it is also a question that I haven't asked. So I would have to, I have to go do some poking around on that one. Okay. And then we have a last one, um, which is what are the current challenges or open questions in space weather? And I know there may be a lot, but we are very <laughs> short on time. So we in have one to... minute. Well, we're really trying to just, un well, that, so, so I'll make it really quick. One is being able to understand what causes an eruption of a CME to happen on, on the sun. And then what is the direction of the magnetic field in that, in that body as it's coming out. And then, you know, what are the consequences of that? Uh, especially during really strong driving, we don't know what that impact's going to be. And that what we, that's one of the things that the, that the CGS star center is focusing on. So 
we have a, a survey, a, a gathering of scientists right now that are spending hundreds of hours trying to figure out what those key questions are going forward. So I, I hope my one minute answer provides enough foundation for moving forward from there. I hope so too. Um, my last question for you is for any students who may be listening today, how did you become interested in data visualization and what advice would you give them if they are interested in becoming a scientist like you? Yeah, so, uh, you know, it, it all starts out with being a geeky, nerdy kid, right, that, that was trying to do that, that thing. And I went off to college and, and studied um, physics in, in, in college, because uh, that was kind of what motivated me understanding the math of the thing there. And and part of that geeky little kid back on, back on Earth who got to go to space camp, he wanted to be an NASA astronaut. But the NASA astronaut selection criteria are pretty tough. And so I, I wasn't going to make that pathway. But when I was in graduate school, I started reaching out to folks that are doing things with NASA satellites. And that naturally led to doing things with computer simulations and, and being able to do that. And so, you know, as a good first step these days, I think one of the key things that I would urge people to do is to try your hand at computer programming and see uh, what you can do and what you can learn from that. And that's really a fundamental skill in, in science. Uh, in my opinion, these days. And with that excellent piece of advice, Mike, thank you so much for being here today to chat with us about using mathematics to create images and the really cool work that you're doing. Also, thank you to our team behind the scenes, Paul, Brad, Aliyah, and Dan for supporting this conversation today. If you're interested in more NCAR Explorer Series events, definitely check out our website for upcoming lectures and conversations and to view recordings of past events. If you're 18 years or older, please take a moment to fill out our three to five minute anonymous survey that should be in your email to help you and help us better understand the impact of the program and how we can improve our next event. That survey will close on Monday. And I really hope to see all of y'all next time and have a great rest of your day. Bye. Bye.